As we continue to reflect upon the wonder of Christmas, of Incarnation Day, the birth of our Savior into this world, we would reflect with the Apostle Paul upon that very truth in 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. In verse 9 will be the text of the sermon. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's kind of hard to break into this in the middle and stop in the middle. And the apostle here and in chapter 9 is talking about giving, the giving of the congregation at Corinth to the cause of Christ and to the poor. 2 Corinthians 8, the word of God. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that would be in Greece, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. And that would be the grace of their giving to the cause. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity, the genuineness of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there be equality." As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with his gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of your boasting on our boasting on your behalf. Thus far we read 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 is the text on which we'd ponder a few moments this evening. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, and you through his poverty might become rich. As a Christian, <clears throat> I say all I ever wanted for Christmas was Christ. And because I want Christ, I want a sound theology of Christ, the sound theology of the Word of God. Because I want Christ for Christmas and every day, I want also a song for the church and for my family, and so that I and the church and my family can live. This is a song of grace, the grace of God in Christ, and it's a song that is a life as well to live by grace. 
this is all I ever wanted. That may not be so important. Certainly what is more important is that the apostle, all he ever wanted, seems to be the same thing. For himself and for the Corinthians to whom he wrote, he wanted Christ, he wanted a sound theology to com be communicated and known together by them, and he wanted a song of grace to sing and to live by. This is what he is urging upon the Corinthians, in fact, in this context of his instruction in this chapter and the next on giving. He would ground the people in the truth of Christmas, in the truth of Christ who was rich, but though he was rich became poor, and for whose sake we are now, who were poor, very rich indeed. This he wants, this great fruit of the congregation, this knowledge of Christ and grace, so that their life shows that they are not just like the world, a bunch of takers and a bunch of those who don't know anything about the gift of Christmas, of Christ. He wants them to show that they know Christ. They know what it is to be on his behalf. They know the song of grace, for that's what uh, Christmas is all about, the grace of God. So to show the authenticity of their faith, that they're not just theologians, that they're not just those who say something about the Lord, but those who are taken into the fellowship of that Christ, who have received the gift of Christ in the manger and on the cross, and who are themselves, therefore, for the glory of God. Now, this, for Christmas and every day, is precisely what the elders, the deacons, and the pastor of this church, and all of us want at Sovereign Grace. All we want for Christmas is Jesus and sound theology and a song of the grace, which is what this is all about, this gift of Jesus, this gift of his truth and his word. It's grace upon grace, wave upon grace, lapping at our shore, in the manger, on the cross, and here now preached. And so we want to hear of Christmas grace as we uh, reflect for a last sermon on this particular theme of God with us at Christmas time and always. But we want to consider Christmas grace under three heads, the Christmas truth or story, the Christmas way, secondly, and the Christmas um, fruitfulness in the congregation of Jesus Christ, Christmas life. Well, <clears throat> there are stories of rags to riches. Maybe you've read some of them with your children, the Horatio Alger sort of things that are uh, popular among American boys and girls, rags to riches stories. They portray the American dream and possibility that there could be a way out of poverty, even abject poverty and, and, uh, and nothingness to some success of some sorts in America. That's such a blessed nation that it is. Well, be that as it may, we have a different story in the gospel, and it begins with this. It's a story of riches to rags, very opposite of the story of the world. In fact, this is what the text brings out here. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Now that's the first part of the story. That's the important part of the story, and by story I mean, of course, truth. Christ was rich. Christ, how rich was Jesus? Do you know that, children? How rich was Jesus? How much money did he have? Well, it wasn't because of anything he had. In fact, the riches of Christ make him as rich as God, the God whom he is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And think of this. God had nothing before the foundation of the world in all eternity because there was only God. He had nothing but himself. It's who he is that makes him rich. He is glorious in his being as God. So Jesus himself, being God, the eternal Son, the eternal and natural Son, the Catechism reminds us, he is as rich as God. In fact, he's so rich that he partakes of divinity just like the Father and with the Spirit. Before creation this is, before he made anything, that made him look rich, that is, that revealed his richness, he was rich, this rich as rich as God. Of this richness, Jesus himself 
uh, speaks of in John 17 when he's praying the high priestly prayer. In verse 5 he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. What a, a beautiful intimacy re reflected here. O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Oh, what a beautiful expression of how rich Jesus was before he became poor. As glorious as God, as great as God, as omniscient as God, before he's a boy, before he's an infant, before he goes to the cross. He is that rich, doesn't need anything. And so when he, who is the son by whom the Father created all the worlds, the word which God spoke into, by which God spoke into existence everything, when he was there, it wasn't because in creation he would be richer, but it's simply because he would express his richness and his glory with the Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit in this way of creation and providence and preservation. There's a richness he has of life, the richness of fellowship with the Father, not needing anyone else. There's a love relationship, a covenant relationship of Father and Son in the communion of the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinitarian mystery of the Christian faith. It's about the richness of God. Anything else, in fact, would be poor. Poverty would be someone be without God. But Jesus is reminding us of the source of all richness, true richness and treasure, and that is to be with God. He himself, being God, is so rich. Think of all the power that he had. Think of how rich he was in virtue. Think of all of the wonderful wisdom that he had in himself. Think of his sovereignty. Think of his being over all things. This is how rich he is with all that is indeed uh, anything we know in the Bible of riches. And so he became poor, and that is the greatest contrast of a rich man to a poor man that there ever could be. Jesus Christ is said to have been rich, and then he became poor. Look how the text expresses this. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're a Christian. You know this grace, and the grace is defined as this. this. Though Jesus was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Became poor. Now this is remarkable. In fact, that he would change it all is remarkable because part of the richness of God himself is he's unchangeable. He's without any variableness, neither shadow of turning. He's like that. As level as she goes, she, he is immutable. And this is one of the glories of himself. And when he creates all things, he does, is not affected by them. He's not conditioned in his choices by the choices sinners make. He's not saying, oh my, I shouldn't have done that. He's certainly not thinking up a plan B when plan A doesn't seem to have been working. He's this God unchangeable. Well, when Jesus therefore becomes poor, becomes anything than what he was, we have this problem of the incarnation, this mystery of godliness that he who was rich now becomes poor, something that he wasn't. Something, in fact, even bad, we would say, or incongruous, unequal to his nature as God. That's what Christmas is all about. It's the great mystery and miracle of the Incarnation. The Apostle Paul speaks of this voluntary po uh, poverty of the Son when <clears throat> we are exhorted in Philippians 2 in this following way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He wasn't stealing from the glory of God. In the form of God, really God, he was equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is the poverty. 
is entering into the manger, his entering into the womb of Mary by the conception of the Holy Spirit was this poverty, this impoverishedness of the Son of God. He was made limited, who is eternal and infinite. He was now a creature, as it were, of time, though not a created thing, the only begotten of the Father. He was among sinners when he was in the glory of sinless heaven. He was one who on this earth had no home. And repeatedly he says that in the Gospels, foxes have their homes and squirrels have their nests and whatever, birds. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's this pilgrim of pilgrims traveling through. And that's why he felt even more at home in the temple than he did in Nazareth with Joseph and Mary. Because the temple pointed to things above and the God above where his home was and where he belonged. Well, so he had all of this and no fellowship with sinners on this earth, not, not anything except that he should initiate. Nobody wanted him, and he's this light, and nobody wants to walk in his light, and the darkness rejects him, and he has this salvation, and nobody wants it. He has the Word of God, and everybody's denying the Word of God. He's no friend, really, and his own familiar friend, this Judas, would betray him, and the others would deny and otherwise not understand him. So he goes to the rags of our humanity and of dwelling with sinners, and this is a great expression, therefore, of his humiliation. The catechism students learn this in the Reformed Doctrine classes. The humiliation of Christ is Christ taking on himself the hum humanity of men, the real humanity, and coming into our sinful existence yet without sin, and even going to the death of the cross. This is his poverty his humiliation, and the word humiliation is from where we get the word hummus or humus, earth. He became earthy, who was the holy God, and the spirit God forever, and who was blessed forever in the communion of the Father. This all was a voluntary poverty. He was one who became poor, who Nevertheless, made himself of no reputation. He came in the likeness of man. He didn't just fall out of the sky. He wasn't pushed out of the communion of the, of the Father. But he came into our existence for our sakes, became poor, and through his poverty we might become rich. This is the glory of the first part of the story. The riches to rags, or we say this is the inglory of it, but it gets better because there's a rags to riches part of the story. That's our part of the story. For our sakes he became poor, that you, Paul's writing to Corinthians, and I'm saying this to you, believers, you, through that poverty, might become rich. Now, this is, again, the other part of the story, the good part, we'd say, wonder of the gospel of Christmas, the presence of this present presence of God, Jesus Christ, who's for our sake, and will go to the cross for our sake. We are made rich by it. Isn't that beautiful? That's why, children, all I want for Christmas is Jesus. And that's why, though you've been given presents, though you've been given shirts and sweaters and toys and so on, candy, and we partake of the culture that way. In the name of Christ, this is simply because Christ is so good to us and we are on his behalf giving and sharing in the gift of Christ as we give gifts to one another. So, with his rags to riches, let me tell you about that story. The story is of sinners who were poor, of all human beings who ever were in Adam who were very poor, but of whom it said some of them who are given faith in Christ are made very, very rich. It's a wonderful uh, richness that happens. It's a great contrast for the poverty, the poverty of sinners, the poverty of the Corinthians, the poverty of us is devastating. We have nothing in this earth. The richest man of the earth, the poorest man of the earth, the middle class of the earth are nothing without God. We are nothing because we are sinful and we are 
made to be in the image of God, but we deface that image by our sin. In Adam, in fact, we're so nothings that we're dead in sin. We're handcuffed. We're enslaved to sin. And sin is something that's governed and ruled over by the prince of sin, that's Satan. And so that Satan has control of us. We are of our father, the devil, unless we be of God by the new birth and according to his grace. It's a miserable existence. Yes, this whole world can be entitled Les Miserables. It's all about miserable people, even in their richness and even in their liberties and even in their so-called being upper class and upper crust and having all of the, the, the houses to go to and the mansions and the places in the Riviera on, on their own special islands in quarantines. They're the haves of this world. Even those, however, have not Christ. Never forget it. We used to speak of people who were on one side of the tracks in Huntington, Long Island, and people who were on the other side of the tracks. I think we were on the bad side of the tracks, but there was the other side, and that was like East Grand Rapids, and boy, those people had everything. And they lived down by the, lake, the, the water, and uh, all we could do was, you know, drive by and look in the windows, maybe. But all of us were together. I never realized that. All of us were together in our lostness, in our poverty, not having a dime to spend that was worth anything for the soul. It was pathetic. Cultured America is like that. They're a bunch of cultured despisers, as one puts it. Yes, they despise the foolishness of the gospel and the the stumbling block, which is the incarnation and the cross. They despise it all. This is their problem. In their poverty, they don't know what it is like to be one who is rich in Christ. They think that would be leaving everything. They think that would be impoverishing them worse than they are. They'd have to, well, they'd have to give up their stuff. That is, give up worshiping their stuff. They'd have to give up their friends and their high, mighty lifestyle. They'd have to do this or that for Jesus. And there's an ethical problem they have, even in addition to the mental problem they have with how God could be poor and how God could be with sinners and how God could be in a cattle stall and how God could grow up and be a boy and then die on the cross. And this is said to be a success. They have a problem with it because they don't want it in the first place. Well, that's our poverty. And we're homeless too, really, because our home is with God, or we're dead men. Our home is a cemetery, or a dungeon, and a hole in the dungeon in which we're buried. It's that bad. But then we're made rich. There's the good part we would say. Through his poverty, you become rich. How rich is that? I want to turn with you to John 17 again. John 17 has Jesus speaking of to his Father and saying, Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And Jesus rehearses what he's done for the disciples, I've manifested your name to the men who have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. They've kept your word. He prays for them. Prays not that be taken out of the world. He prays not that they'd be, uh, you know, holed up in some monastery somewhere. But he would keep them in the world, and he would keep them in the world in which they're kept. He'd keep them by the truth. He kept them also united. And look at verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, whereby he was rich, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Now, <laughs> I want you to ponder that. The glory that Jesus had from the Father is something he says is given to the disciples, not only to those 11, but to all that would follow the glory of participation even in his own life, that they may be one, even as 
uh, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Love them as you have loved me. Isn't that amazing? We're made rich with the love of Christ and the love of the Father through Him. And the love of Christ and the love of the Father through Him, whereby we're taken up to Him, to be one with Him, as one as Jesus is with the Father. No, not essentially, not divinely, but somehow we're given, as Peter says, to partake of the divine nature. Now that's a step up, isn't it? That's what's happened to every child of God made rich that way, being a participant somehow in the divine nature of God, in the riches of his own virtues, in the glory that's to come, so that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 would say, we reign with him in heaven right now. And I like to say to the catechumens when we're considering the order of salvation in Romans 8, and we're foreordained, and we're justified, we're called, and we're glorified, something like that. And I say, really, all of that, all of that salvation is given to us principally when we are saved. You see, what God does when he saves us through the poverty of his Son is he lavishes us and even bankrupts heaven, as it were. One describes it. He makes us rich with all his richness, with glory itself. That's why the apostle would say in Romans 8, verse 17, we are heirs with Jesus of, let me read it here. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We're joint heirs with Christ of God. We receive God. God is our inheritance. He's in our bank. He's our land. He's our home. He's our fellowship. He's our light. He's everything to us. And life itself, which is life eternal. Now that's grace, and that's what Paul says is grace. Just says it that way. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's this story. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. That's a definition of grace, the free favor of God. He was rich, he became poor. Through his poverty, you're made rich. Amazing, amazing. That is what we should know if we're going to be living out the wonderful truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And now I want to talk about that way. You may have noted that I skipped over the part that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I left out, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now this is speaking of Christ and this riches to rags and rags to riches story as the way whereby that's accomplished. The Christmas way is defined here, this way of grace, as Jesus coming down, that through his poverty and nothing else, through his humiliation, for our sakes, we might be rich. This, therefore, is Paul including here the sound theology that incarnation is connected with crucifixion. The only way that Jesus is riches to us and we become rich for his sake is if he not only comes down to this earth but he goes the way of the cross in obedience to the Father. He is one who eats and drinks the words of God in obedience to him but he does this all the way to suffering for our sake. Christmas is connected with Good Friday which is connected with Easter the whole thing. That's why Christians so-called who are that in name, who come to church maybe only on Christmas and maybe show up in, in, in uh, Easter, they miss the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ comes to this earth, not simply to be an example of someone who's poor for God's sake. 
He's not a mendicant. He's not a beggar. He's not some Roman Catholic uh, fool who thinks that by meriting something, even by giving up something for Lent, he can earn something for himself and for others. No, he's not a mendicant, a lowly beggar, but he's a Messiah. And Messiah comes to this earth to go all the way to hell. He goes all the way that God's justice requires. He pays the debt of the law for us sinners, and this is the way out of our poverty. For your sake, through his poverty, we are made rich. Through his poverty, just that way, through the cross of Jesus Christ, it's why the Apostle Paul glories only in the cross of Jesus Christ, by which I'm crucified to the world and the world to me. Nothing else. Notice, it's not even here said that through faith we're made rich. Rather, what the Apostle do, is doing here is he's getting right to the basics, the fundamental of Christmas which is the Christmas cross, which looms on the horizon of that little boy, that infant and that little boy, so that we might understand that all of this is truly outside of us. It's not a work in us, it's a work for us. And grace is all about that. Grace is something that meets us and we're not even there yet. It comes into our existence. It comes into this humanity, we're not born, and it's displayed there, and it happens. It's given to God's elect for whom Jesus died on the cross so that there is this way out of the poverty, this way out of sin. Very, very important to understand that. There's this objective reality of grace, the grace way on the cross. Before we believe, before we're even born, we were justified on Calvary. We were forgiven. All our sins were forgiven on Calvary. That's what it was all about. The dark and bloody ground of God showing his wrath upon his son for our sake. That was what was being fought there. And that death was being, was being uh, performed there, executed there on behalf of God's people. So Christmas, without blood, is not something that's going to make anyone rich. Christmas, where Jesus is just the cuddly babe, and rather cute, and Christmas, which we can replicate by a crutch, a living manger, which is blasphemy, don't ever try that. Don't ever even think of that. It's as bad almost as the movie The Passion of Christ. You can't duplicate that. Any attempt at this and being entertained by this stuff and thinking that your faith will be worked by this is vain. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. If anywhere people would see Christ, Christ born, and Christ crucified, it's in the church. We don't need Hollywood to tell us how to act out Christ. We are on the behalf of Christ. We bleed for Christ. We suffer with Christ. We live, and Christ lives in us. So Christmas without the cross is not the way, but Christmas all the way to the cross, and then the empty tomb. So from the womb, to the tomb, and then the empty tomb, is the way of grace, free favor, undeserved favor for us, but then in us. The Christmas way is Christ, and not in addition to that way, but because the way of, is Christ, it's also the way in us, the way into us. And that's what we have to remember. How did the Corinthians ever get to be rich? It was by Christ dying for them, but then 
by his working in their hearts this life of Christ and giving faith in the Holy Spirit so that there was this breakthrough of the hard, stubborn, miser of men that we are. He broke through them and he breaks through us, beloved. This is what grace does. It finds a way even into us, not only unto the earth, but even into our hearts, which are not ready to receive them, to, to receive him, which are inns that for which there's no room for Jesus to lodge for a night or forever. He makes a way and grace makes a way into souls that are hardened and bittered by life and that have rejected everything before in Adam. They're dead in sins. We're dead in sins by nature, children of wrath. And to us, this gospel truck, this story is no greater than any myth. Give me the rags to riches myth and not the riches to rags story of Christianity. That's who we are, but grace says, I'm finding a way. I'm going to find the way, all the way, for all for whom Jesus died. You see, Jesus superintends grace. That's why grace is not a mere possibility or probability. Grace coming from the fountain of grace, even Jesus Christ, cannot be stopped. There is a fountain. There is the election of God, and there's this one Jesus Christ who mediates the flow of the fountain, as it were, and chosen in him for whom he dies, there will be grace into our lives and there will be grace as well than giving us to know the grace of God. Did you see that? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says. You know this. You're assured of this. This is your life. This is your experience. And if you're not knowing this and maybe you're knowing other stuff more and you're entertained more by other stuff and interested more in other stuff, maybe you haven't known the grace of God, but those who know the grace of God know this is the main thing. So that Christmas is not just a day, it's every day. And the truth of Jesus Christ, God with us, is ours to live by forever. That's the story of Christmas. Grace for you on the cross the same grace of Christ unto you and you and you and me. And we're given faith to know this and to live the Christian life. My final point. This Christmas life, that is life in light of the rags or the riches to rags and rags to riches story of the gospel is ours. We live it. We have no other life. No other life. We used to be saying, 20 years ago, they began saying, get a life, you know, to all of the fools in the earth, to all of the outcasts, to all those Christians especially, that get a life. Get a life. Don't ever succumb to the temptation of the devil who is behind that word. Get a life. You have a life. You have the life. That's your identity. You don't need to change it. You don't want to change it. It's your life. Christ is your life. And the Christ who was born once in the earth, one place the apostle says, I believe, he's born again in you. It's as if he begins his incarnate life, and I speak reverently here, not wildly though, it's as if he begins his incarnate life again each time he takes over your life. And each time this king from heaven who's at the right hand of God in his exalted nature now condescends again to make you his temple and to come into you and to be your life there's this Christmas reality so that Paul says, I live, but nevertheless not I, but Christ lives in me. And there's this growing of Christ in you, this development of the image of Christ. So we're transformed according to his image. And this 
is something beautiful. That's what grace is. It's beauty. And it's all about his favor and his power. Because grace has its way such that having been born again, grace overcomes all the grace killers. You know, there's lots of grace killers and joy killers in this world. It could be your own tendency to be pessimistic. It could your own, be your own tendency to be like Eeyore in the, in the children's book. That donkey's always down. It, it, and we can be that way. Donkeys who are always down. Let's be real. That's why we need wives, or we need husbands, or we need friends. We need one another. Sometimes even a pastor who's not always grumpy. We need those who are grace promoters. But the devil has a stream of grace killers. He wants to uh, send our way if it were possible to destroy grace and the effects of grace and the life of grace and the consciousness of grace. Maybe it's a past. The devil says, aha, here it is again, that past. It keeps on plaguing you and now it's going to plague you again because you can't get rid of it. That's who you are. You're just an angry old man. That's who you are. You're just a sullen sort of person. That's who you are. You're just one who's a mess up. And grace all the time is saying, no, you're not. You're in Christ. And the word of God to which grace directs you is saying this. And it gives you all these promises. And it's directing you to believe the promises and not to believe the words of the devil. Grace overcomes them and grace gives motivation as nothing else can do. The Apostle Paul here is, in fact, motivating the Christians in Corinth to be as the other Macedonian churches who, in a great trial of affliction, um, the, abundance had in, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were free, freely willing to give to the cause. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying they were like that, they did that, now you be like that too. There's a motivation because it's not about a, some competition, but it's about grace over here and grace over there. They did it there, you do it here. And so you enjoy this communion with other churches who are giving to the cause of Christ and giving everything up even for the cause of Jesus Christ and the promotion of the glory of God. Grace is the motivation. Ah, people and theologians of all stripes have thought to find other motivations. And there are truly some that are tangential to grace, but nothing like grace. For example, they say the law. You ought to keep the law. And the law is the motivation. In fact, you might be condemned by God if you don't keep the law perfectly, if you don't give enough to the church of Jesus Christ, if you're not, you know, uh, converted enough. Well, beloved, that's nonsense. Grace is without the works of the law. Grace is grace is grace. And yes, we're directed by the law, but motivated and motivated to try to escape condemnation, to merit something with God by the law, by keeping the law, impossible. Don't try to do it. But be motivated simply because God has loved you and now you love God. That's the main thing. No fear of hell, though a fear of hell is healthy to have because we all deserve it. We should act like those who are afraid to get burned by the fires of the wrath of God, of course. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, the apostle would say, but always in the context of the Father's love. This is our hope. This is our rags to riches story because of him who was rich and yet made poor for us. And then finally, this means, beloved, we have the life of givers. And this is what I, the elders and the deacons and all of us together would continue to promote at Sovereign Grace Church. By the grace of God, it's remarkable how we are united in our giving to the cause here, the cause of Jesus Christ. Not just financially, though that indeed, but we are here giving to the cause of Jesus Christ that we represent, that Divine Hope Seminary represents, that others may represent to whom we would give, but we are here especially giving ourselves. God so loved the world that he gave himself in his son. And this is what we emulate. God, we give ourselves. It's not about giving things. It's about giving yourself. That's what relationships are about. That's what a healthy, vibrant church is all about. We give ourselves. We 
We are glad to continue to give ourselves. We are not, it's not about us, it's about God. And when we give ourselves, we are showing that we are image bearers of the Father. And that we understand the Christmas story, the wonderful, wonderful story of grace, the truth as it is in Jesus. We give incarnationally. We give happily. We give creatively. We give confidently. Though it hurts. It hurts when we give and it hurts our egos when we give an apology, for example. We give because Christ came and he gave himself for us. We, beloved, are rich. In fact, even as we suffer with him, this is the truth of the story of Christmas. Jesus Christ went from riches to rags that we might go from rags to riches and maintain that wonderful treasure forever because God keeps us. Now that is all I want for Christmas, Christ and sound theology and a song for me, my family, and the church family at Sovereign Grace and throughout the world. The song of Christmas, the song of free favor for sinners and riches that earth cannot afford that we are given freely, that we might praise God, the God of our treasure, the God who is our treasure. Oh, beloved, rejoice in that. Sing and live. Sing and give for the cause of Jesus. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of the gospel of the wonderful incarnate Savior, which truth is the truth of the cross and the, uh, the awesome sacrifice he made for us there. We thank you, Lord, that this is the truth of his resurrection, his mediation at the right hand of God, and his coming again. It's all of it. We thank you, Lord, for this, because we live out of this. This is our life. This is our glory. This is our joy. Lord, make us happy and happier and happy in holiness as we hear this word and are sanctified by it. Grant your spirit and grace that we may go presently on our way that there might be you presiding as well at the congregational meeting and in our homes as we are those who fellowship and spend the rest of the Sabbath together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.